elder scrubs. <laughs> Happy birthday. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Aren't you glad that we're known by God? What a blessing it is. You know, uh, A.W. Tozer said the greatest thing you can tell about a person is what they know about God. And that is the most important thing, really, in our lives is, is what we know about God and known by God is really every other aspect in our life. Uh, because it's the greatest decision that we make is to uh, trust Him with our lives. Today we're going to be looking at a passage, or actually a chapter, in the book of Colossians, Colossians 2. And uh, Paul wrote to the church at Colossae, or Colossae, how you want to pronounce it. And Paul had never uh, visited this church. Uh, it was started by a man named Epaphras, uh, which history says that he might have become a convert at the church of Ephesus and started this church. But neither say or there, uh, Paul writes to the church to encourage the church. And he could be writing to the church of Weekstown. I write to the church of Weekstown uh, that I pray for you. I've heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus. I heard about the programs and the things you're doing there at Weekstown. And uh, I am praying that you're able to stand firm and fast uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ, being rooted in him, because storms come. Amen? Could, could you hear that? That the storms of life come, and if we're not rooted in something, we could be up, moved, and set to the side. And so uh, the world today, Lord, is throwing all kinds of things at us. And the Bible teaches us that there is a foundation, we just sang the song, a firm foundation to stand firm on. Because if we don't stand in truth, we'll fall for everything. And so, therefore, we need to stand firm in what the Bible has taught us and what we have come to know to be truth in our lives. And so in chapter 2, Paul wants the right to the church and say, I have been wrestling for you, uh, and I, if you turn there with me, here's the words that he used. He says this, I want you to know that a great conflict I have for you and for those at Laodicea. Laodicea was close to Colossae. Why was he wrestling with this great conflict? By the way, the Apostle Paul was isolated in a Roman prison as he writes this epistle, this letter. And the Apostle Paul has been called by the Lord Jesus Christ uh, latter part of his life uh, to understand that it is by grace that we have been called. You know, and that's the greatest thing we'll, we'll find out uh, as we walk this Christian life. It is the grace we need daily. Right? We are saved by grace and we need grace by him every day. Otherwise, you'll find ourselves in a performance phase, which we're going to look at here. What that means is the do's and the don'ts, and I won't do this, I won't do that. We find ourselves uh, under this performance-based religion, per se. And Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship with our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It is a relationship. And we rest in that relationship. How many feel tired today? How many feel wore out from things today? And a lot of times, we're wore out and we're tired because we're running in our own strength. Amen? And the Bible says, be strong in the Lord and His mighty strength. We're trying to fix things that we can't fix. You remember last week we looked at, I don't know what to do, but I put my eyes on you, Lord. That's the place that we have to settle in at. We have to come to the conclusion that the God of all creation is our God and our Savior. And this is why Paul starts to write to the church at Colossae because there are those who snuck in with heresies 
that diminished who Jesus Christ is. Well, they said Jesus Christ was a spirit and he was a God, a demigod, maybe, but he wasn't the God. And see, today we fight those things also with different religions that come in. And, and uh, if we don't have a firm foundation rooted in knowing who Christ is, right? And if he's just a God, along with all the other gods, then that's where our foundation will lie. But if we understand who Jesus is, the one who died for us, the creator of all things, the one who had the, the and came in the flesh and the deity was was all in him, uh, then we start to have a greater understanding uh, of the battles that we are fighting. So listen to why Paul writes this letter to those. He loved them, he was encouraged, he thanked the Lord for them, and uh, that's the way. Uh, I am so thankful for our church here and for those that are standing fast in the belief because there is a tide coming, isn't there? And it's been uh, trying to uproot believers. And, you know, it's a little yeast that destroys a whole batch of dough. And it's subtle, you know, it's, it's just part truth. And that's the way uh, false teachers act. They send forth uh, part of the truth and it sounds good. Matter of fact, Paul calls it fine sounding arguments. You know, he says, Don't be held captive to hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on the things of this world, human traditions, basic principles, rather than on Christ. And I'll explain some of those things. What we experienced today, back then, what they were experiencing was those that were Gnostic. Gnostic was uh, those that were of this cult, per se, that had a higher knowledge. They knew things that were more spiritual. Do you ever meet anyone that knew more than you and they, they kind of let you know it? Paul says it was those, don't let those fall prey, uh, or we'll read the, the verse, he says, but those who go to great length say that they have seen things, uh, um, you know, worship of angels and so on. So let, let's read this and then I'll come back to it somewhat. So he wants them to know, verse one, the great conflict and those that let Laodicea and for many has not seen his face. He's telling them he's, he's never met them. And then he says, verse two, and in their hearts they may be encouraged, knit together in love, attaining to the, all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Know this, I say, at least anyone should deceive you by persuasive words. Now stop right there and maybe explain a little bit what the mystery is. In chapter 1, verse 27, he tells you what the mystery is. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see... When you become a believer, when you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, part of the Trinity comes to live within you. That is the hope of glory. That is the mystery that happens. You see? But there are those that don't believe that, that try to up, up, usurp uh, that type of teaching. So, read that again. Verse 4 now this I, I say, that anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent from you in the flesh, he was not there, I am with you in spirit and rejoice to see how good and order and steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Now verse 6 through 8 is what we'll just settle, settle in for a minute, a minute. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the traditions of men, 
according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. Father, give us an understanding of what is transpired here. Help us to understand the grace that has been given to us. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Jesus bought the church with his blood, the precious blood of Christ. We are saved by the grace that was given to us. We could not earn this. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ. The grace that he has given us in the beginning, we need to continue in. What had happened here, and it has happened uh, to many of the churches in the first century, is still going on today. Matter of fact, there's a verse in Col uh, Galatians in chapter uh, 3, verse 1 and 2, it says, You started well in the spirit are you so foolish now what you started in the spirit you're trying to attain your goal by human effort okay the church has been born supernaturally but yet we try to progress it physically and naturally and worldly and we allow the 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 compromise of the world to come in with persuasive words of how we are to rule and run and and direct the church of something that is supernatural uh, into the natural realm. I like to read a little more because, and then we'll bring back to this. And he tells us in verse uh, 11, he says, In Christ you were circumcised, not circumcision made with hand, without hands, but putting uh, off of the body of sin of the flesh, but a circumcision of Christ. Meaning it was a supernatural thing. We know that back in, in uh, the Jewish people, their covenant was made by this uh, circumcision that was done in the flesh. And if you know, if you don't know what circumcision is, um, it's uh, what was cutting away the flesh. It was just a, a point that the their covenant was a mark that they made with uh, with the Lord. Um, but here it's saying it, it's a supernatural thing. Um, he goes on to say um, that verse 16, he says, Let no one judge you by what the food uh, you eat or drink regarding the festival or new moon or Sabbath, which were a shadow of the things to come. And then in verse 18, he says, Let no one cheat you. Uh, of the reward by taking delight in false humility uh, and the worship of angels and, and uh, intruding into those things which has not been seen. Uh, they're vainly puffed up by their flesh and mind and are not holding fast to the head whom all the body and nourishment knitted together by joints and ligaments grow. Talk about Christ holding the church together. Um, therefore, Verse 20, if you died with Christ to the basic principles of the world, why as though you live uh, or living in the world and subject to yourself to these regulations, the do nots, do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. What has happened is their false teachers have come in and told them that their, their, their spiritual growth and, and what makes them spiritual is what they do. Keeping Sabbaths. Have you ever? Today we have those that have special days, and they say that that's what, like Saturday, is the day that they go to church. I'm not going to be naming some of the names, but but they keep these special Sabbaths, and they think that that's what keeps them spiritual. You hear what it says about worshiping angels. You know, uh, there are those that religions that say, well, we got a special revelation. Uh, from angels and therefore this is the way that you need to go you need to follow us the, the, the Joseph Smiths and uh, there are those that, that, uh, religions that, that are Mormons that had, had a higher uh, knowledge they found plates of revelations that were given and, and so it usurps who Jesus Christ is and so they insert other things and so others it sounds like fine-sounding arguments, and others start to 
follow that way, but therefore, that is not the ways of Christ. See, it is through him, to him, and for him. Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. We rest in that. See, religion is not an outward. Christ came to change us from inward out. And so there were those that were sneaking in and said, you really want to be religious and, and get something spiritual. It's the things that you do. And it sounds well, right? It sounds, I feel very spiritual. And I feel, but the problem of performance-based religion is that we never meet. You know, well, if you do meet some type of, uh, you know, you laid out, uh, you know, uh, this week I'm going to read three chapters in the Bible. And, uh, you know, that's going to make me more, you know, spiritually grounded and so on and and so I do the three chapters I feel good about myself but the final week I don't make the three chapters so I feel less about myself and it's like a roller coaster up and down and it's a it's this you know performance based religion that comes to usurp who Christ is by grace you have been saved grace is an unmerited gift been given to us you see and then it's the Holy Spirit that comes in you, the, ministry, the mystery that he's talking about, the hope of glory, he starts to change the inside out. He, he doesn't just change, you know, your conduct will change down the road, but he comes to change your disposition from the inside out. You see, the hope of glory, Christ in us. And there are those that, that came into the church in the first century that also are today trying to um, wipe out everything that Christ has done. Now, <clears throat> there are those that had this Gnostic belief that they were, the Greeks were saying that they believe that, uh, you know, God is spirit and he's pure and he's holy and, and you're right to say it, but he could have not come in this flesh. And in 1 John it says, Do not believe our every spirit. Those who deny that Jesus Christ had come into the flesh are not of God. But there are those that believe that Jesus didn't come in the flesh. Now these are the subtle things that come into the churches. He says. Uh, and one of the, the biggest religion there is out there believes that. That Jesus can't be God. He was one of the demi-gods. But there are greater prophets before him. One was Muhammad, one was Moses. Jesus was just one of the prophets, and uh, he couldn't have been God. Now, your faith and your salvation depends on what you believe about Jesus. Because Jesus said to himself, Who do men say that I am? So if you think he's just a prophet, or you think that he's just a good teacher, or if you think that he uh, just uh, came within the spirit, then where is our salvation found? Him? Because Jesus himself said, I am the Father and the One. He said, I am. Jesus is God. And as believers, we wait for the glorious appearance of our what? Great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. What the scripture said. Because there are even other scriptures out there. Have you, you know, the canon of scriptures are 62 uh, independent, combined, uh, the, the word of God right here. That's what we have as the canon of scripture. That's what we believe, been inspired by the Holy Spirit. But there are those out there that had different passages of scripture. Gnostic gospels, lost gospels. They say some things that are very, uh, I don't know, hard to, uh, to receive. And if you ever read some of them, that, uh, you know, crazy stuff. But they slip in to the church and a little yeast starts to destroy a whole batch of dough. And then we start to think, well, maybe, you know, that sounds kind of good. It's a fine sounding argument that, you know, uh, you know, God is holy and he's perfect and pure. 
How on earth would he come and be a man and walk among us? That, that, that really, you know, that might sound kind of... So if you start to believe that way and you start to think or entertain that, right? Then it usurps the truth of what we know about God, what he said. You know. So one of the reasons we start to struggle uh, is what we think about who God is. Now, <clears throat> Paul wasn't condemning this church. He was forewarning them. He was forewarning them that these teachers are there, they're around them, they're coming. And guess what? They're there all around us. There, there are worldwide religions that base their whole doctrines on those type of things. But we sit here today and we say, yeah, well, you know, I've never believed those type of things. But don't we get caught up into performances at time also? Right? Look what he says, verse 18, let no one cheat you of your reward by taking delight in false humility and the worship of the angels, intruding into the, those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body is nourished and knitted together by the joints and ligaments grows and increased that is from God. Talking about Christ. Jump up with me and look at verse 21. Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. These are those teachers that have come in and they said that this is your your, your spirituality. I've never been, uh, you know, this do not kind of religion Although after Christ comes in our life, there are things that change in us, but it transforms us from the inside out. Uh, it's not that my religion is I don't do this, I don't do that, I don't go to this movie, I don't drink that, I don't smoke that, I don't wear this, I don't... That, it's the total different changes me from the inside out, not from the outside in. Because I'll wear my religion on a sleeve, you know, the way I dress, the way I do, the way... The places I go, the doors I knock, the things that happen, uh, there's an outward religion than the inward realities of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. But look what it says here. These things indeed, verse 23, have an appearance of wisdom and self-imposed religion, false humility, and the neglect of the body. There are those that, uh, you know, would withhold and you know, they would eat certain things or so on. I mean, I was brought up that I couldn't eat meat on Friday. You know, there were certain things that you know, couldn't eat and, uh, because that brought me closer to God. No, no, it did. Because this is what it says. That's false humility. And it, the, the neglect of the body would say, but are a no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Do you see that in the first? Those things, by doing this and doing that, do not do this, do not, have no power over the inside work that only God can do. Over anger, over temptation, uh, over frustration. Uh, all those things we need to be changed from the inside out. <laughs> So that's why you have millions of people that go through the religious motions, a lot of motion, and there's no change in their life. This Bible is not just here for us to have knowledge. It is for that, but it's to transform us. It's to change us from the inside out and to recognize that Jesus came to live within us we are to be rooted in him. If we go back to our key verses, what does it say? In him, uh, I'm sorry, verse uh, 6. You are therefore, you have received Christ as Lord. We walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as you were taught, and abounding with thanksgiving. You know, that's a very pointed thing right there, abounding with thanksgiving. When I find myself... When I find myself being ungrateful, 
it's time to take a check. It, it really is. And, uh, and I find it a lot, you see? But in humility, I have to go back and sit before God Almighty. Now, who, who is this God? You'll read in chapter 1, look at verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the first firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created. Who? By Jesus all things were created. He is your creator. Right? Do you know that? Do you understand that? Do you believe that? So if you sit there and you kind of meditate on who God is, what you think about God, you exalt Him, you praise Him, and, and things start to transform and change in your life. In verse 16, For by Him all things were created that are in heaven, and that are on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. That gives you another perspective of things, doesn't it? Your religion chase changes a little when you understand the God who died for you and loved you and went to the cross for you is the creator of all things. The one enthroned in heaven that sits in the the sphere of the atmosphere, the one who can change, who says to the waves, you stop and halt there, and says to the stars, and again, name by name, and to the universe, he is your God and your Savior. But we forget that. Uh, sometimes we call him, you know, man upstairs. We, we, I've seen t-shirts and it, it grieves my heart. Jesus, my homeboy. Not recognize that he is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And it puts a new perspective of who and what we are. In humility, we bow ourselves before him. So God, I can't, but you can. But when we start to think that we can, we go in the performance mode of things. You see how that changes? <clears throat> how the church will be built. This is his church. See, I remember uh, Apostle Peter was going to the temple at three in the afternoon. There was a man that wanted to beg alms from him. He says, silver and gold I have not, but what I do have I give to you. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, be healed. Everything comes through him, to him, and for him. When the day of Pentecost, when the church was built and, and birthed, yes, they started to speak in unknown tongues. Yes, there was 120, they were in the upper room. Yes, they were, but what happened was sounds from heaven came. This church was birthed supernaturally from heaven. You see, and that's what we have to recognize. Are we to perform in some ways as the Spirit leads us? I get frustrated at times when I'd like to see the church grow, but you know what? The only way that it'll grow is through the power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's good to have programs, but... If these programs are not infused and say through the Holy Spirit, they are just programs. They are just worldly philosophies, hollow and deceptive. You see? And they'll sneak into the church. And then we find ourselves on this roller coaster ride. We've done pretty well this week, final week. We feel defeated. There's so much here that I, I pray that you would study and look at it. Um, if you turn with me, I would like to just read a couple things in 1 John because in the epistle of 1 John, he was dealing with the same things of the Gnostics and those who snuck in and, and tried to put their uh, twist on who Jesus is. 
And if anyone ever comes to you and says that, well, Jesus was a good man, he was a prophet, Jesus was a God, not the God, uh, I would just say, run. Because we have them today that come. I don't know if you ever had them come to you. And, and they know the scripture. Some of them, really. Because if you challenge them on the certainty. But they're there. And so if someone could get you to believe differently than where you put your faith and trust and hope, where does that lead you? I'll tell you where it leads you. It leads you to yourself. And you all know, and I know, when we're left to ourselves, boy, we're there for trouble stuff. <clears throat> How many know that we can't save ourselves? If Jesus is not who he says he was, we are dead in our sins and our trespasses. We're still separate from the life of God. But he is who he says he is. In 1 John, this is what he tells him in chapter 4. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit. This is chapter 4, 1 John. Whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now he says this, this is how you know. By this you'll know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ came in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard, which is coming, and is now already in the world. I love these next couple verses. I just can keep reading. You are of God, little children, and you have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Who is in you? Christ in me the hope of glory therefore i don't need no one to teach me any other different or higher knowledge or some mystical things the holy spirit teaches me truth do you know um, i love verse 9 there's this same chapter where it says and this love of god was manifested towards us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might want live through him. What are we? Rooted in him. Live in him. Build up in him. Following him. Not a teaching. Not a program. Not anything else but what God had told us. You don't need someone else to teach you any different. Someone comes to you that you're just not there yet. I have some different teaching for you. Something higher and mystical. See, there are those that are teachers who say, well, you know, if the more knowledge you have in this, that you're going to be more spiritual. The greatest thing you can do, I'll tell you right now, is to yield yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. To let him work in us what is pleasing to him. You may have to stop daily and surrender. Morning by morning, bow our knee before our mighty God, our Creator. If we thought differently of who God is, that makes all the ramifications differently in our lives too. You know that? That's why that most important thing is that you know who Christ is. He died for you. He loves you. He's your God. He's your Savior. And our allegiance is to Him. The Bible is filled with instructions. The Bible is filled with the guidance. Tell us. Um, God has given us this anointing so that we can abide in His daily. This past week, uh, 
I've been reading a book, if you get a chance, you can pick it up from Paul Tripp. It's uh, called Do You Believe? And it's about the doctrines of God and what you think about God and what to know about uh, the Lord, what we think about Him, who He is, uh, how holy He is. You know, if God's holiness wasn't His holy. He said, be holy, uh, therefore, as I am holy, God tells us in His Word. And you think, well, what is this, this holiness? If, if God wasn't holy, righteous, and true, just think of what this world would be like. Do you know that He holds back much and restrains much of the evil. There, there's going to be a time when that's going to break loose. But could you imagine if God in his holiness and his righteousness did not restrain some of the evil in the world? None of us would be able to go down to the supermarket would we? because this place would be totally made. You see, that is our God. That is the sovereignty of our God, the holiness, the righteousness. If God wasn't holy and righteous, he, he would have never sent Christ to die on the cross for us because he loves us and he wants a relationship with us. And none of our works, per se, could bring us closer to God. They're like filthy rags is what the scripture says. It is only by the blood of Christ that brings us nigh to a holy and righteous God. And so I would ask you, did you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Not, a, not your own works, not what you've done. You might have been in church for, for 30 years, and, and you might have been a, a Sunday school teacher, and, and you, you, you might have preached from the pulpit, but did you trust Jesus Christ as your God and your Savior? Do you believe he died on the cross for you? Do you believe that you needed a Savior? My Bible says that we all fall short of God's glory. We all need a Savior. Amen. And if we come at that in any other direction, we're still dead in our sins and our trespasses. Well, I'm a pretty good guy. You ever hear that? You know, I'm pretty, you know, I've done this, I've done that, I went to the mission, I all that is good stuff, but it'll never save you. And we miss the mark of what God's telling us. To trust Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. That He is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He is our God. And I would hate to miss that. For anyone to miss that. There is something within our human makeup that wants to do things we feel good about it. You know, we, we feel like I really don't need anyone else. You know that you know that this pride. Pride will keep us out of the kingdom of God. We have to humble ourselves before God's mighty hand and knowing that we're in need of the same. Otherwise, we think we got this. I was one of those guys. I heard about that. I don't need that. I'm different. I'm smarter. Friends, please. And I know this message today is a little different, but I think it's very important. It's the foundation knowing of being rooted in Christ. Because if we, we don't start and finish there, everything else we do is for vain, for naught. So I'll stop here. I just love you guys. And just like the Apostle Paul, he knew about the church at Colossae. He prayed for them. He was encouraged by them of all they were doing, how they were in the faith. But he knew, and he wanted to forewarn them, that there are those that are coming that want to divert this truth of being rooted in Christ. And friends, it's all around us. May God bless you. God be with you. <coughs>